since we know that electric vehicles are vastly better for human health and vastly less damaging to the environment, it's no surprise that across the world countries are looking to ban the dirty and harmful internal combustion engine. In much the same way that when it became impossible to deny that smoking killed, countries often placed limits on smoking and banned it in public areas, many countries have now realised that they need to do the same for good old suck, squeeze, bang, blow, and they've introduced bans that are coming into force pretty soon. And about time too. So today we're going to talk about how countries are moving forward with those plans. Sorry. Sorry. Hello? Um, yeah, no, I'm filming it right now. What, what, what do you mean, all wrong? Oh. Uh, no. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll fix it. <sighs> well, I guess we're not doing that video today. Instead, let's talk about why some countries are fighting tooth and nail to poison their citizens and desperately trying to turn back the clock on gas car bans. As is often the case in the legislative arena, there's been some push and pull around the notion that we should ban fossil fuel vehicles. While EVs can now meet nearly all use cases, there's some things that they can't do as well, and let's say that the current situation with EV infrastructure is not ideal. Add to that the endless lobbying from the fossil fuel industry and from the automotive industry, both of which argue that 60 years is nowhere near long enough for them to have come up with a transition plan to stop burning stuff, and politicians who, shall we say, are supported by those self-same industries. And we have a bit of a perfect storm brewing. So first, a bit of background. But before we get into that, Erin, our amazing illustrator and animator, has just released our Halloween shirt. And it is so good I didn't even wait for the staff discount to buy it for myself. <laughs> You can buy it on Redbubble. Go on, I'll wait. And remember, you can also support the channel from $1 a month. Now, back to the show. In the US, back in the heady days of 1978, the corporate average fuel economy standards, better known now as the CAFE standards, came into effect. These were one impact of the Republican Party of the Times' efforts to stop companies completely destroying the environment and avoid things like, you know, Rivers catching fire? Yeah, that, that was actually a thing that happened before we started regulating businesses' pollution. Anyhow, over time we've seen those standards, which are controlled by the EPA and NHTSA in the United States, gradually get stricter. In Europe, until the rise of the European Union, things were a bit more hazy, and not just because of the pollution. And also, frankly, legislation was less effective. From the mid-1970s onwards, some individual countries like, for example, Germany and Sweden, introduced rules governing how polluting a vehicle could be. But because there wasn't alignment between those countries with rules, and rules in other countries, and plenty of individual countries didn't bother with such trifling things as making sure cars were even vaguely emissions regulated, to make cars comply, they would often be hobbled and performance highly restricted or fuel economy heavily impacted by quick and dirty modifications to make cars that kinda sorta met the rules when it wasn't worth the effort to do a proper job for one small market. So it wasn't until the rise of the then EEC and now EU that in 1988 a more or less Europe-wide set of emissions rules came into effect. Rules that actually had more of their intended impact because manufacturers had a large market to sell to, which required those standards be met. But in all honesty, things started getting good in the 1990s. Ha <laughs> ha! 
hang on, hang on, M. That isn't what the 1990s looked like. Did did you just do a story block search for the 1990s and put in whatever came up? Cheeky bloody millennials. Anyway, fast forward to the 1990s and in Europe we see the beginnings of the Euro standards for vehicle emissions. Those are the emission standards that have gradually got stricter and stricter and the seventh iteration of which was just adopted this year to go into effect in 2025 and which some more retrograde countries in Europe are arguing about. The Euro standards also formed the basis for the standards used in China, although as of this year the standards in China, China 6B, are stricter than the current Euro 6 standards. In the US in the 1990s things got really exciting though because California's CARB, the state body responsible for setting vehicle emission standards for California, which incidentally because of its history of world beating smog is the only state that gets to set stricter emissions rules than the rest of the US, well California created the zero emissions mandate. And that requirement that a certain percentage of vehicle sales be zero emissions at the tailpipe is really what set the Romulans among the Klingons. Because over the past two years we've seen multiple states enact a requirement that by 2030 to 2035 all passenger vehicles must be zero emissions and the Euro 7 standards require all passenger vehicles and light duty vans to be zero emissions by 2035. This is all part of an attempt to keep climate change to no more than 1.5 degrees C of warming by 2050. Which is going to be hard because we're looking at hitting 1.5 degrees of warming this year. So yeah, speed is of the essence here boys, girls and NBs. But of course this has some challenges and people are notoriously bad at long term planning largely because our brains are kind of built that way. And also we don't like doing things that are hard or that require change. So we've entered this perfect storm. We have a world in which things are shifting rapidly because of climate change because of the failings of venture capitalists who have run into the fact that not everything can be monetized indefinitely, and because of the pandemic. And because frankly my little Gen X bubble was too small to slowly transition power from the preceding generations which has led to this sudden step change in both politics and culture as millennials take over from retiring boomers. And in all these ways and more things are upsetting the status quo. Whatever you want, whatever you like, Whatever you say, you pay your money, you take your choice. No, it's just whatever better to let her do it. Whatever you choose, whatever you win, whatever you lose. And in this world have stepped industry lobbyists, both for the automotive and the fossil fuel industry, and populist nationalist politicians who like to sell the comforting lie that everything will be just fine if you only hand over power over everything to them. On the fossil fuel lobbyist side they have a variety of lies to deploy. There aren't enough resources. EVs aren't really cleaner. EVs aren't going to be as cheap as gas cars. We'll still need oil for some things at least for a while so why stop burning it anyway? Climate change isn't going to be a problem. There was an earthquake! A terrible flood! Locust! It wasn't my fault I swear to God! And on the automakers lobbying front there's a raft of arguments about the cost of transition being too high. We're going too fast, we just don't have the factories for all the batteries, all the jobs, all the jobs will be lost, our dealers will be hurt, we're doing our best but 2035 is just too soon. They told me they fetched it. <laughs> It's not my fault. Of course these arguments are backed with lots of promises to support politicians future endeavours and election campaigns. You can count on any time, anywhere. You can count on to be behind you there. And maybe you know set things up so they don't have to I don't know, misuse company funds to build a house or anything when they go into the private sector like some poor billionaires have been allegedly forced to do. 
and unsurprisingly the UK's Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders SMMT welcomed the British Prime Minister's move to delay the UK transition to zero emissions which I'm sure he described as levelling up in some incoherent way. This is of course despite the fact that many world politicians, including some in the UK government's cabinet, have significant personal wealth tied up in the success of the fossil fuel industry. So when they tell us that they're making the world a better place for our children, you do have to wonder if it's an attempt to make the air cleaner for all our children or whether they literally mean better for their children by ensuring they have a massive multi-million insert currency here bank balance to leave their beloved privately educated offspring in a healthy trust fund. Also can we just be honest here for a second and consider how seriously we take a government official who claims that they want to think of the children of the future but also wants to deport children fleeing genocide from a faraway country. Because I have a lot of questions. Lots and lots and lots. For populist politicians they'll mostly say whatever's convenient whether or not it makes sense. So long as it sounds good enough for the moment. EVs will only be made in China for example when they're already being built in the US and there are multiple companies building more factories to build them in the US or in Italy where the transport minister Matteo Salvini from the far-right league party part of the coalition in power there right now said of the ban of internal combustion engines included in Euro 7 that it was quote madness and that it would quote destroy thousands of jobs for Italian workers. A simplistic view that fails to take account of the possibilities of new jobs created and attempts to hook its claws into nostalgia about Italy's engineering heritage uh, but takes advantage of the fact that Italy is still a significant motor manufacturer. But there is a fly in this ointment. Well several flies. It's a very diptera heavy ointment when you get down to it. First up, while I am possibly the last human to use GDP as a measure of anything terribly useful, Italy is a bit of a weird outlier and not just because they elected a far-right government having actually experienced the hot mess that these silly sausage actually make of governing. But because manufacturing remains hugely significant to the nation with around 20% of its GDP coming from that sector. Although agriculture trounces that with over 60% of Italy's GDP but agriculture doesn't have quite the same sex appeal. In many financially better off countries a huge component of GDP comes from tech or financial services. For example the tech sector makes up around 10% of GDP in the US and the automotive industry just 3% and both of those pale in comparison to the service sector nearly 80% of US GDP. So pandering to the desires of one sector that doesn't actually make a huge chunk of the GDP has a tendency to upset other sectors and as has been seen in the UK where there's been a huge outcry from both the tech and significant portions of the manufacturing sector all of which were looking forward to investment benefits from an early transition to electric vehicles isn't always popular. The other thing that industries like other than unfettered subsidized access to natural resources without any meaningful oversight naming no names fossil fuel industry is regulatory stability. If you're going to invest billions of insert local currency here into a new factory or upgrading a factory then the very last thing you want to find after you've broken ground is to discover that the target market for whatever you're making is suddenly five or ten years further away than it was when you planned out building the thing. So while automakers are whining about having to build EVs they need to get their level of whining pitched just right so the mandate doesn't go away completely because if suddenly there's no market for the batteries from the brand new battery factory they've built then there's a problem that's answerable to their shareholders and no CEO or CFO wants to be the one in the position to have to explain that they've invested millions of dollars of potential profit and bonuses in a factory that's just going to sit idle. Interestingly one other factor that seems to be biting is that climate change's far more rapid impacts seem to have politicians on the back foot. It's pretty clear we're in a tiny window where the impacts are really obvious to everyone with a brain 
and we still have a chance to do something about it. Which is maybe why the German push for e-fuels didn't meet with the excited enthusiasm from other nations that they were clearly expecting. Much to the embarrassment of German Transport Minister Volker Wissing, only three nations signed up to the declaration to develop e-fuels. The Czech Republic, Japan and Morocco, leading to it to basically be quietly shelved. So will we see a complete rollback or a significant delay to the zero emission mandates? In Europe, right-wing governments like those in France, Italy and Poland are banding together to attempt to scrap the Euro 7 requirements, and they are pushing hard. In the US, the right wing is similarly averse to electrification, so it really depends on who's got the levers of power. And it also depends on how hard the various fuel companies and automakers push against the regulations, and how hard the people lobby their governments to actually do something to act. And how that will pan out is something we'll only get to see going forward. There's no retro computing easter egg on this video because I'm going to take a little longer on this next bit. Scrolling by on my right is the list of amazing charged up supporters and if you're not on the list we're sorry there's been some issues with the automated process we've been using and we're actually rejigging our credit setup so watch this space. Oh, and if you've recently joined and your name isn't on the list, we're sorry, the list hasn't been generated for a while while we try and work out what's going on with these bugs. In the meantime, thank you to all the people listed and all the people who have joined our Patreon recently. Our ad revenue is $3,000 less in the last month than it used to be, so you're really helping us stay afloat and avoiding this channel shutting down. Thank you, and if you're one of the people who has pledged $1 a month, Thank you. And if you're someone who has $1 a month to spare, please consider supporting us. As we're still about two and a half thousand dollars short every month, this YouTube adpocalypse continues. Shoutouts go to our V2G Patreon supporters Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett, Elder, Brophy, Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C. Hey Esker, John Trammell, Kyle Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Regine Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Tezza in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Kyle Hodgson, Chris Asenta, Denny Hyde, Lance Schall, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off-grid supporters, Paul Conway, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Burness, Robert Flannery, Aaron Han, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witt, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Grayland, and, of course, Ian. Don't forget we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on the main channel, plus Sunday on Take 2. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon, and as always, keep evolving!